All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first lecture of three for this semester series of lectures in the history on the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States hosted by Princeton University's Keller Center. We started this series in the spring of 2021 and are thrilled to be continuing it. I'm excited to tell you about this, this series and then I'll introduce you to our amazing speaker, Dr. Allison Blakely. My name is Isam Beezer and I'm a university administrative fellow hosted by the Keller Center. I'm also a PhD candidate at Rutgers Business School where I study entrepreneurship from both, perspective, from both the contemporary and historical perspectives. The center's mission is to arm our community with the intellectual foundation, innovation skills, and networks to propel positive and sustainable societal, societal impact. As a center, we recognize the pervasive and systemic racial inequity, inequality um, in our country and how this deeply, how it's deeply linked to so many of our country's most profound challenges. We understand how important it is for our community to have this understanding of these systemic inequities as we work to solve some of these most pressing challenges. And that brings us to the series of lectures, of this series of lectures. For all interested in innovation and entrepreneurship, much can be learned from the entrepreneurs who have succeeded under some of the most daunting constraints. At the end of the day, isn't that what entrepreneurship is all about? It's assembling limited resources and hopefully you have some impact. Black innovators and entrepreneurs have overcome restrictive markets, segregation, Jim Crow laws, lack of access to capital, even threats of violence and death, um, theft of intellectual capital, and many other um, extreme challenges that um, seem not real, but, but are. Uh, yet, they thrived. These entrepreneurs have created innovations that have resulted in lasting societal and cultural changes far beyond the Black community. By exploring the history of Black entrepreneurship and innovation, we want to learn from the creative strategies that Black entrepreneurs employ to succeed. At the same time, we want to explore how the constraints of um, explore the constraints on Black entrepreneurship and business development, and how, and how this has limited the overall economic development, not only of Black communities, but of society as a whole, and how so many of these constraints, which have become institutionalized, can be overcome in the future. So this is a really practical um, series and insightful, hopefully motivational, um, as it is for other attendees as in the past. So this is an exciting series of talks that bring together scholars and academics from numerous institutions across the country um, to share their scholarship in a discussion-based forum. Um, Dr. Blakely's talk is titled More Than Just a Notion, Audacious Ambition Versus Challenges Faced by 19th Century African-American Entrepreneurs. But before I hand the room to, to today's scholar, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box in Zoom, and at the end, I will um, ask your questions. Uh, so before again, before I hand the room to Dr. Begley, I can't I tell you everything about him. He has a wonderful long career, but I will put some highlights and it's based off of um, what's on the website. So he's Professor Emeritus of European and Comparative History at Boston University. His doctor is in Russian history from University of California at Berkeley. He's the author of several books, um, Blacks in the, in the Dutch World, The Evolution of Racial Imagery in a Modern Society, also, Russia and the Negro, Blacks in Russian History and Thought. And he's also the winner, that's also the winner of the American Book Award. Um, among his uh, numerous chapters, one is uh, Blacks in the US Diplomatic and Consular Service, 1869 to 1924. Uh, a must read, very, very interesting. Um, and his most recent scholarly publication is The Contested Blackness in Red Russia in the Russian Review. He's also the former president of Phi Beta Kappa Society and serves on the editorial board of its magazine, The American Scholar. He's also a member of the National Council on the Humanities, in which he was appointed by President Obama in 2010. Uh, again, there's much more to read about him, so I implore you to look him up. Um, but without further ado, uh, Dr. Blakely, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isa, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin uh, also by, by thanking the organizers for inviting me to participate in this exciting series. I've titled my presentation, More Than Just an Ocean, Audacious Ambitions Versus Challenges Faced by 19th Century 
African-American entrepreneurs. While this series is expressly uh, about the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States, I'm here offering some of what I, as a specialist in European history, have gleaned from some of my research on the European wider world that is relevant to this theme as well. In my study of African-American consuls and diplomats who served in European posts, I've come across a number who also had serious entrepreneurial aspirations abroad. The 19th and 20th century figures who first come to mind for me for this are Mifflin Wister Gibbs, John L. Waller, and Richard Theodore Greener. Although Greener's professions were in education, law, and politics, he also authored little known writings on capitalism, agriculture, and individualism. What I'm intending to suggest by my title is that what is generally known about achievements in Black entrepreneurship does not begin to capture the broad scope and boldness of aspirations and accomplishments in that sphere that can be traced back centuries in American history. To its credit, the United States Department of State was the first major US government department to appoint Blacks to positions of prestige during the period from the Civil War to the 1920s. In the interest of providing a, a bit more historical context, I want to show you portraits of a small sampling of these men, uh, including a number whom you're more likely to recognize than those I'm uh, focusing on here. I'll not have time to pause on, on these uh, pictures in detail at this point. I just want to read their names and, and show you uh, that they nearly all had multiple careers, but you can find more about them as well as much of what I'm presenting here today in my chapter on them in an anthology I co-edited titled African Americans in U.S. Foreign Policy from the Era of Frederick Douglass to the Age of Obama. The very first African American uh, appointed to a diplomatic post was Ebenezer uh, Bassett. And you can see uh, on this that he was an educator and diplomat. Uh, he served in, in more than uh, one post. Uh, the other uh, individual on this slide is someone you may have heard of, John Mercer Langston, another educator, a diplomat, and politician. And of course, everyone knows this iconic figure, the reformist, orator, and journalist, as well as diplomat. Uh, Frederick Douglass. George Washington Williams is actually best known as the author of what is arguably the, the first uh, history of Black Americans, uh, a survey history uh, written by him in the 19th century. James Weldon Johnson, of course, is, is very famous as the author of the lyrics to what's often referred to as the Negro National Anthem. But he was a teacher, a lyricist, poet, civil rights activist, and diplomat. And here is Mifflin Wister Gibbs. I'm going to sp spend uh, a good bit of time on him uh, today. Entrepreneur, lawyer, politician, diplomat. And next to this is really a uh, cover of, of a recent book by uh, 
uh, Dale Logan Alexander, and it's on William Henry Hunt, who really was the first career uh, Black diplomat. And also pictured here is, is his wife, Ida Gibbs Hunt, who was a teacher, Pan-Africanist, close associate of W.E.B. Du Bois in that movement, and a civil rights leader. Another one of my principal figures, uh, John L. Waller, lawyer, politician, journalist, entrepreneur, and diplomat. And this is his wife, uh, Susan. Finally, Richard Theodore Greener, educator, lawyer, consular officer, social and political activist. I estimate that <clears throat> there were over 60 uh, Black men who received appointments to Foreign Service positions during uh, that period. Diplomatic appointments were not as glamorous as they would become later after the Foreign Service was professionalized in the early 20th century, but they were presidential appointments usually for political or financial uh, patronage, and they conveyed the title of the honorable, which was especially respected in the black community. One downside was that the areas earmarked for blacks to be assigned to, mainly in Africa, the Caribbean, and South America, they were often unusually dangerous because of the climates and many who served developed chronic illnesses. Some died as a result. The government's main reason for such appointments was to reward prominent Black intellectuals for political support in delivering the Black vote, especially in the Republican Party, because that's where most Black support went until the Great Depression, since it was the party of Lincoln, the great emancipator. This incentive decreased, however, by the end of the 19th century because of increasing voter suppression laws at the same level, uh, at the state level under uh, Jim Crow. And now to Mifflin Wister Gibbs. Gibbs' life included a remarkable number of different careers and lasted into his 93rd year. He was born in 1823 in Philadelphia, son of a Methodist minister whose sudden death when Mifflin was eight years old forced him to quit grammar school after just one year in order to find menial jobs to help support an alien mother and four siblings. His first truly gainful occupation at the age of 16 was as a carpenter's uh, apprentice in an apprenticeship uh, that led to his becoming a journeyman contractor on his own. Meanwhile, he gained literacy through a local colored men's literary society and eventually became active in the Underground Railroad with William Still and others. And in 1849, he accompanied Frederick Douglass on a dangerous abolitionist speaking tour in Western New York. Upon receiving word the next year of the gold rush in California, he sailed west as a steerage passenger when racism in San Francisco prevented him from working as a carpenter. He became a partner in a clothing import firm that did so well, his new status allowed him to become a civic leader and a member of state Negro conventions in 1854, 1855, and 1857. He was later prominent at national Negro conventions. He was also co-owner and editor of an abolitionist newspaper called The Mirror of the Times. 
Then in 1858, he moved to British Columbia after gold was also discovered there. He set up a new store for his firm and again prospered well enough to invest in real estate on the side. By 1866, he and his wife, Maria Alexander, were settled in Victoria, BC with their five children. And he was elected to two terms on the city's common council. He became director of the Queen Charlotte Island Coal Company and began studying law on the side. After they decided to return to the United States in 1869, Gibbs completed formal law training at a business college in Oberlin, Ohio, where his wife had attended Oberlin College, as would subsequently three of their children. After touring the South to determine what seemed to offer the most promising future for Negro residents, Gibbs settled his family in Little Rock, Arkansas. There he again achieved phenomenal success, culminating in his election as municipal judge of Little Rock, the first Negro elected to such office in the United States. In 1876, he was elected a presidential elector for Arkansas on the Republican ticket. In 1877, he received his first federal post when Rutherford uh, B. Hayes, President Hayes, appointed him receiver of the U.S. Land Office for the Little Rock District of Arkansas. He was a delegate to all but one of the Republican National Conventions from 1868 to 1897, when he was appointed U.S. Consul at Tamatave, Madagascar, serving there until ill health forced his resignation in 1901. However, this was by no means the end of his active career. He returned to Little Rock and published his autobiography, which is titled Shadow and Light, an autobiography with reminiscences of the last and present century. This was published in 1902, and Booker T. Washington wrote the introduction. While he was receiver of the land office, he had encouraged thousands of immigrants and others to homestead in virgin Arkansas land and help them establish schools emphasizing trade schools, as Booker T. Washington would, of course, have applauded. In 1903, he became president of the newly organized Capital City Savings Bank in Little Rock. He became a partner in the Little Rock Electric Light Company and a large shareholder in several other companies as well as owner of several pieces of local real estate. The advice he gave his readers in his autobiography included the following. The advancement of any race in morals and culture is retarded when poor and dependent. It is indispensable to progress that it has the benefit of earnings laid by. In other words, savings. It is therefore to these industrial features that we must look for the foundation of advancement for the race. A greater number must be fitted to obtain work more lucrative in character and more ennobling in effect. Institutions of science and business pursuits seem to me the great doorway to ultimate success. Morality, learning, and wealth are a trio invincible. For most of the final decade and until his death in 1915, he remained active, traveling and giving public lectures. 
reflecting back on his career from our vantage point can be both uplifting and depressing as its end coincided with what historians came to call the nadir, the low point in the history of racism in the United States. Uplifting because of all of his accomplishments, but especially depressing at present when we are experiencing a new nadir in which once again, racism has become respectable enough in American society for at least a third of the population to either espouse or accept it with little over objection. In the last chapter of his autobiography, with a wry joke about the Supreme Court's un undercutting the 14th Amendment by giving final authority to the states, Gibbs acknowledges that the struggle for full realization of the lofty ideals of American democracy will probably always be ongoing. Gibbs's uh, foreign service tour in Madagascar was relatively uneventful. But a few years earlier, that post had been the center of an episode involving his predecessor once removed, John L. Waller. Waller's remarkable story illustrates some of the pitfalls confronting prominent Blacks who attempted to move beyond the limited realm of activity the establishment deemed acceptable for those of their so-called race. His career prior to his consular appointment was almost as varied as Gibbs's and already contained ample evidence that he might try to overstep racial bounds. Though born a slave, he too had become a lawyer, entrepreneur, and journalist, and would later serve as a US Army officer as well. His time as consul at Tamatave was far more eventful than Gibbs's because it corresponded with the takeover of Madagascar by France which climaxed with a military invasion in 1894, just after Waller's tenure ended. Then a bizarre twist of affairs began in March, 1895, when French authorities arrested Waller because of a private business venture he had remained on the island to pursue. Waller, had exploited close ties he had established with the Malagasy royal family to obtain a large land concession worth millions in products such as mahogany, teak, and rubber. His intention was to create a colony there through leasing the land and recruiting black settlers from the United States to lease parcels from him. In fact, he'd already uh, advertised in the United States for this project. Waller's career showed a, a lifelong commitment to black colonization projects. Having participated in the wave of black migration to Kansas prior to his consular post, he would also later, after serving in Cuba during the Spanish-American War, he would float a proposal to have the U.S. Congress appropriate $20 million to sponsor immigration of Blacks from the South to Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. There's therefore little reason to doubt Waller's sincerity in the Madagascar land project. Nevertheless, the French government convicted him in a military court on charges of breaking French postal regulations and transmitting military intelligence to the Malagasy based on a flimsy interpretation 
of a letter of his, the French intercepted, that criticized the French invasion. The true French motive appears to have been simply to prevent Waller from restricting their total control of the island and its valuable natural resources. He was convicted and sentenced to 20 years of solitary confinement in France. Waller would later publish an account of how, during his shipment to France, he was chained to the floor of the ship for seven days and without food or water for two days and nights. Responding to embarrassment over international reporting on such treatment of a former U.S. consul and to pressure from Waller's wife, Susan, and the Black press, both houses of Congress passed resolutions directing the State Department to obtain Waller's release after 11 months of confinement that had further damaged his health that had already been adversely affected by the climate and illness that uh, he suffered during his service. John Mercer Langston was among the attorneys pleading his case. Predictably, the main condition of his release was that no further claims against the French government over the land or over his treatment would be considered valid. Richard Theodore Greener, like Gibbs, was also raised by his mother, first in Philadelphia where he was born and then in Boston from the age of nine. His father, Richard Wesley Greener, had an ex extensive career as a sailor, a ship steward on numerous vessels before retiring to try his hand in the gold fields of California. But unfortunately, he died there of illness. Like most of the others accepting diplomatic appointments, Richard Greener was very accomplished and very ambitious. Here is an excerpt from his essay of self-introduction when entering Harvard as an undergrad. I am particularly interested in metaphysics, general literature and Greek and Latin classics when divested of grammatical pedantry. My plans in life are to get all the knowledge I can, make all the reputation I can, and quote, do good and make a comfortable competence as the corollaries of the other two. I think I can do these best in the profession of law, unquote. So in addition to his plans for moving his working quarters, improving his working quarters, as you can see uh, in the sketch he made in uh, designing the improvements, this is from uh, taken from uh, reports back to this, State Department and Counselor Dispatches. In addition to taking up that uh, necessity, he started peppering his superiors in the State Department with letters recommending his promotion to Consul General for that entire region. Back in the States, he'd already achieved a very impressive array of professional positions. And that after, in 1870, becoming the very first black graduate of Harvard College. There had been uh, a few to uh, Harvard professional schools before that, but he was the first uh, of Harvard College. There he'd written a prize-winning essay and a senior thesis on land tenure in Ireland. 
So already uh, showing a great interest uh, in points abroad. After serving as principal of the only black high schools in Philadelphia and Washington, during the reconstruction period, he had served as the first black professor at the University of South Carolina, while also learning that law degree he had always been seeking. After being forced out of his professorship of philosophy at South Carolina, at the end of the reconstruction period, he served as Dean of the Howard Law Department. During that period, he also gained a reputation for advocating migration of freedmen to Western states such as Kansas to acquire land. Then followed appointments to political uh, patronage positions. For a short time in the 1880s, with the help of his cousin Isaiah Wares in Philadelphia and with other uh, Black businessmen, Greener had founded and become president of an insurance company called the National Benefit and Relief Association. Although the company never generated much in earnings for him. And during uh, that period, both he and Robert Terrell, uh, a black cum laude graduate of Harvard College and also a lawyer, were denied membership in the Harvard Club in DC because of their race. That status might have aided Greener's commercial interests. Later, during his years in New York, following his service there as secretary to the Grant Monument Association, which was another patronage appointment he'd received, in partnership uh, with four white associates, he became president of the Dominion Pulverizer Company, that is a rock crushing company. Unfortunately, that also proved to be unprofitable, as did a stint as president of the General Development Company, which was a gold mining operation in Nova Scotia that soon petered out. So by the time he arrived in Vladivostok in 1898, Greener believed that positions of prestige were what he deserved based on his demonstrated talents and level of education. The first consular appointment offered to him had actually been to Bombay, India, but he asked for an alternative after discovering that the bubonic plague was raging in Bombay. He saw Siberia as a region of great economic potential and himself as the principal agent for the expansion of American business into Siberia. And he strove aggressively to advance both American interests and his own. Here, it's also important to point out that his official title in Vladivostok was commercial agent because Russia at that time was not receiving officers there at the rank of consul from any countries. So in his years as a U.S. commercial agent, he gained much additional knowledge about business affairs that would have been very valuable had he become an entrepreneur in earnest. In his correspondence with his cousin Isaiah Wares back in Philadelphia, he bemoaned the fact that, quote, I can scarcely hope to do more than make a living while here unless some opportunities for trade arise. Had I been appointed here in the first instance, I could have had a chance to have doubled my salary the first year for an American, an, an old resident, died here in May, and I would have had the administration of his estate, $40,000 at 5%. But luck didn't run my way that time. End quote. In his dispatches to the State Department, Greener showed great insight 
regarding that historical moment. In the wake of the Spanish-American War, he viewed the United States as now an imperial power competing with the seven other countries that had commercial agents present in Vladivostok and as potentially the dominant industrial power in the world with Germany and Japan as her main rivals. Completion of the Trans-Siberian Railroad during his tenure also underscored Russia's role as a growing world power. The outcome of the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-95, which concluded with a treaty facilitated by the President of the United States, further vindicated his claim to be in an, a location of major importance for American national interests. During his first two years, he overwhelmed his superiors with so many detailed, well-written proposals that they responded with complaints about their sheer length and degree of detail. He proposed initiatives such as establishment of a regular American steamship line between the Pacific Coast and Vladivostok, a department store featuring American goods, an American mineral water industry involving a Russian partner, and the introduction of California fruit products into Siberia. At the same time, Greener was also keeping his eye out for ways to advance his own personal business interests. He wrote to his cousin Isaiah, quote, I believe an American store with American goods would pay in time and be self-supporting at the start. And 5,000 dollars or 10,000 rubles would set it up. My French colleague, that is a fellow uh, commercial agent, my French colleague runs a magazine Francaise or French store. My Chinese ditto has an interest in a dozen. And the Jap officials all have an eye to trade, end quote. He wrote simultaneously to Senators Thomas Platt of New York, Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts, and others offering his candidacy for the rank of Consul General should one be established there, and wrote the State Department urging the establishment of one for all of Eastern Siberia. He received neither encouragement for his proposals nor recognition for his efforts. In fact, the only signs of appreciation he received for his six years of service in Russia came from visiting American businessmen he aided in their pursuits and from foreign governments on the scene. He was decorated by the Chinese government for his role in famine relief in North China in the wake of the Boxer Rebellion. And during the Russo-Japanese War, he looked after the interest in Vladivostok of both the Japanese and British governments, whose representatives were forced to leave temporarily for diplomatic reasons. To his dismay, his own government instead dismissed him from his post and from the consular service in 1905 based on an unsubstantiated uh, charge of improper conduct, but also simply because the State Department wanted to upgrade the post to the status of consul and to return to the pattern of favoring white men for European posts, especially since appointing black diplomats had sharply decreased since the Jim Crow system had by the turn of the century drastically suppressed Black access to voting. When his appeals of his, this decision failed, he retired to Chicago where he took up his final residence after 1906, still highly respected, especially in the Black community. It should be noted that such low regard for Greener was consistent with the treatment of other 
uh, Black recipients of such appointments to consular and diplomatic posts during that period, a period when internal memorandums in the State Department at times referred to them as, quote, coons, or sar sarcastically as, quote, our colored brethren. In Greener's case, the best expression of his frustration is captured in a reflection I found in his correspondence with friends at home during his tenure in Vladivostok. Responding to reports of race riots at home, in one letter he wrote, quote, as I sit here writing, surrounded by my two big flags while the little one floats over my office, I feel how anomalous our position. I, an officer of the government, powerless or indifferent to my protection at home. Here I am virtual commander of any naval force to protect me or any American interest. At home, in the satrapy of DC, I could be murdered at will for my political uh, opinions. Color prejudice played a major role in limiting Greener's opportunities for advancement throughout his life. This was perhaps made all the more painful for him because when abroad, his complexion and other features were such that he nearly always passed for white. And he could have also at home had he not been so strongly committed to the cause of racial justice. His isolation was further heightened by the fact that in the course of a bitter divorce, his wife, Genevieve Ida Fleet, and all five of their children had dropped the final R from their family name and passed over into white status and white society by the time of the 1900 census. During that period, W.E.B. Du Bois observed that thousands of Black Americans were passing as white. In a highly informative and otherwise insightful 2017 biography of Greener titled Uncompromising Activist Richard Greener, in referring to Greener viewing diplomatic service as a plausible track to a successful career in public life, the author, Christine Chaddock, concludes, quote, Greener would have been quite naive to view such a highly political appointment more than two decades before the Foreign Service was organized on a merit basis as a career pathway, end quote. On the contrary, as indicated by the title of my presentation here, the word I would prefer to describe Greener in, his, in this instance, as well as the other men I've been talking about, the word I would ch choose is audacious, which I think applies to his and, and their whole careers, beginning in Greener's case with his improbable admission to Oberlin, Phillips Academy, and Harvard. I would also submit that the green, career of Greener's contemporary consular uh, appointee, William Henry Hunt, whom I mentioned earlier, belies what Ms. Chaddox uh, assumes. Hunt's career as a consul began in Madagascar at the turn of the century, and he was appointed in 1906 precisely the point that we leave greener, he was appointed to a highly coveted European consular post in France that led 
to further appointments in a career that would last for over 30 years, including several other posts, uh, making him the very first Black consul to make an actual career of the Foreign Service. And this was despite having begun before the professionalization of the Bureau. Greener's entire career had featured far more failures than successes, as I've shown you. Nevertheless, his bold attitude resulted in his becoming one of the most notable public figures of his time. Thanks for your attention. Wow, uh, Dr. Bickley, thank you so much for such an insightful and an important talk. Uh, you really brought out the brought these people to life for us. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I want I want to learn more. Uh, we have a lot of questions uh, for you. If you have a, a few minutes for us, my time is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, so um, the first one is that you mentioned a few spouses earlier in your talk. Are you able to share a story or detail related to spousal impact as it pertains to this fascinating topic? Now, say, say that again. Uh, this question is about spousal spouses. You mentioned um, Ida oh, Gibbs Ida, Hunt. Ida, yeah. Yeah, or, or others. Um, so any, the person asked, all right, can you share a story or detail about spousal impact um, on, on these people? Well, it, except for Greener, <laughs> Who's, whose sad uh, ending to his marriage uh, was, was so uh, disappointing. What, what I found in all of my research is, is that the, the, the spouses were really an essential part of, of the success of, of these uh, outstanding individuals. Uh, in, in the case of, of Waller's wife, Susan, he, he might have spent that whole 20 year tour if she, if she hadn't been such a busybody and, and kept on on, on, on the case of, of the, the Congress and uh, getting the word out in, in the black press. Now, th there was an advantage that uh, Waller was someone who had also been a journalist. So, so she knew a bit, you know, about um, you know, what you might call um, the, the kind of uh, public uh, uh, relations, uh, which buttons to push, where to try to get the word out. And it, it turned out right, especially since the international media was exposing um, American racism in the way that it was. I mean, the French were brutal. But you would expect that any country with any self-respect would not have allowed one of its former uh, consuls to be treated in that way. But it just showed that uh, the United States, which was not yet uh, known as an imperialist country, uh, was more in sympathy, let's say uh, the United States government, more in sympathy with the French than they were with Waller. And of course, these uh, individuals were, in a way, living in, in, in parallel universes because they didn't have the kind of respect at home at all that was commensurate with the kind of respect they would have in those official positions abroad. But the United States had incentive in uh, putting up at least a front of uh, a democratic system. And so since following the Civil War, uh, the former slaves were given the vote. And since voting was at least the framework that the United States wanted to project, project, project itself uh, to the rest of the world, it's sort of like, well, you can understand, it's sort of like today. <laughs> we, we haven't really outgrown that problem where uh, you would think there would be more excitement, more public excitement about the fact that something like half the population is more committed to wealth and, and power as a decisive factor in, in choosing leadership uh, than 
democracy in terms of, of the ideals. And so she had help, but it was really, um, I think it was kept alive mainly by, by her, Susan Waller. Great, thank you so much. Uh, love that. And um, you mentioned a, a notable figure in African-American history globally by, by some people, W.E.B. Du Bois. Is um, it was he see a looming figure in some of the the times, like in some of your research? Because I, I read that he's he's like a self appointed scholar diplomat. He wasn't anything official in a lot of ways. Is it, was he featured prominently in some of these people's lives? Or I know you mentioned one relationship with Hunt, but is he was he considered for, for African American diplomats someone important or 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 not? Well. As, as, I, as I pointed out, Hunt, Hunt was really the only professional diplomat. And uh, Du Bois, uh, in comparison to these figures who, you know, began their lives much earlier in the uh, 19th century than Du Bois, although he lived to be in, into his 90s, uh, some of these, like Greener, he he may have uh, had a higher level of of respect at that particular time than Du Bois. Du Bois was just coming into his own as we move into the twentieth uh, century. But they all highly respected uh, Du Bois, even though they didn't all uh, agree uh, uh, with him. Uh, in in the case of uh, you know, Booker T. Washington, he was, for a couple of decades, he, he was uh, the most pivotal uh, intellectual figure in uh, the parceling out of, of establishment federal appointments. And so they had much more ongoing uh, contact with him. But even, even though uh, they, they stood on, on different sides, with respect to questions like um, uh, forms of activism, uh, they were definitely connected. And you, you can find uh, publications which in effect list uh, what the Black community like to, to, to call, uh, you know, uh, Black figures of note. And, and you would find a dozen on the page, and as you got closer into the, the 20th century, Du Bois would always be there, but some of these other figures were more prominent before the turn of, of this of the century. It, it was mainly a, a question, not just the question between Du Bois and, and uh, uh, Washington about whether or not it was time for Black people to have full rights as opposed to just um, being patient and and taking whatever uh, they were they were given uh, short of, of political uh, equality. Uh, sometimes it really had to do with differences about what the best approach was, like uh, Douglas and 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 Greener uh, at one point were widely known for their debate about whether uh, black people should remain in the South or uh, migrate to, to other places North or Midwest where uh, they might have uh, greater opportunities. Toward the end of the century, uh, it, 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 it looks as if they came to more of the same mind that it, 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 it might be uh, necessary to go ahead and 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 move. But Douglas was very idealistic in thinking that uh, people should stay put and, and demand all of their, their freedoms and uh, just make democracy work. But there was that kind of background of, uh, well, these conventions I mentioned, these national black conventions and state conventions, that those were the kinds of issues they were discussing all the time. And these consuls 
they might be abroad for um, a while, but when when they and they in their correspondence, they kept up on what was taking place at home, and then they would come back and um, trying to make a contribution. You take Greener, uh, he's, he's a good example of a, of a kind of an enigmatic uh, figure because in his personal philosophy, he seemed to think that the best contribution he could make was just to, as, as that little snippet uh, from his uh, Harvard essay said, he, he wanted to be what you might call a role model, impactful figure. He thought, if, if I can just prove to the world what someone who is, is branded as, as Black, even though he could pass for white, if I can prove what all we can achieve, then I'll raise the whole race just by that demonstration. And so he wasn't as much into participating in, in, in movements like Du Bois's, like the Niagara movement that ended up developing into the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In other words, he thought that with his in individualism, he could uh, make such a strong demonstration that uh, this would make a, a great contribution. Um, but he wasn't opposed to the people who wanted to organize, mobilize, march, and so forth. It's just that he wasn't as much into that. Nice, thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's um interesting take on him. I, I love it. And I have another question, one more question for you, please. Um, comes from the audience again. In the case of Greener, do you see the white diplomats who replaced him and the State Department begin to take advantage of any of the trade recommendations that Greener offered to his superiors? You know, it's, as far as I can tell, they, they didn't really. I, it, it's really complicated when you get into the, the, to the politics of it. I always have wondered uh, why uh, some of those were, were so obvious in terms of the potential for profit. But how, how can, how can uh, we account for some of the decisions were made uh, at at the, the highest levels. For example, why in the world would Russia sell Alaska to the United States? I mean, of course, they couldn't know that gold was going to be discovered or anything like that. But I mean, just and they sell it for sold it for nothing, <laughs> yeah, essentially. And they just think of what the world would look like right now if they'd held on. Uh, to Alaska. So it, I've never been able to answer some of the, the, the kind of logical uh, questions. Uh, you know, citric fruits to, to Siberia uh, seemed like a natural to me, but they weren't really interested. That's the thing. It's sort of like our politics right now. A lot of what's going on doesn't have to do with policies. It has to do with some other kinds of uh, concerns. Great, thank you so much. Um, so, thank you, Dr. Blakely. I think we've we've um, we, we've gone over a little bit of time, but it's very worth it. It's not every day we get a scholar of, of your level here. So, thank you so much. Um, this concludes today's event. Uh, thank you, Keller Center and Princeton for supporting this, and please. Um, Keep up with uh, Dr. Blakely's work. Um, he has a lot of work out there. So read up, look at videos, everything like that. Um, so thank you for attending. We have two more lectures this semester. So please keep an eye out for those and register if you can. So thank you again, Dr. Blakely. Mm -hmm. right, take care. Bye-bye.
Learn more about the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States by visiting kellercenter.princeton.edu slash Black entrepreneurship. Join us for future Keller Center events, which you can find at kellercenter.princeton.edu slash events.